Hello and welcome to SNEA. We are here at the Cloud Storage Technologies Initiative and delighted that you have decided to join us for our presentation. Uh, we're going to be talking about IT modernization with AIOps and we're going to go pretty deep into the world of digital transformation. And we're also going to be talking about what that means because quite frankly I've always had my own questions about it. And we're going to be understanding what it actually means in the world of changing data architectures. So my name is Jay Metz. I am uh, uh, the chair of the CNEA Board of Directors, and I'm going to be your host and moderator for this webinar. Uh, I'm going to be fielding your questions as well and providing the basic administrivia for the webinar. The man of the hour, though, is the person you're here to see and hear. Uh, that is uh, Parvis uh, Piravi, Global CTO and Principal Engineer for the Financial Services Industry Solutions Group at Intel. Hello, Parvis. Uh, hi, Jay. Thank you for um, uh, giving me this opportunity, and I'm also co-hosting the uh, webcast. Fantastic. Uh, we're going to get to we're going to get the parties in just a little bit, but before we begin, I need to introduce you, our friendly audience, to a couple of key points that you may or may not be aware of with regards to the Bright Talk interface, uh, especially if you haven't attended one previously or if it's been a while. So first of all, you can expand the screen size. Uh, this could be important if there are many details during the presentation that may appear difficult to read. You can simply enlarge the screen to full screen mode. Uh, second, you can download this presentation by choosing the option on your screen under Attachments and Links. It's available right now, as a matter of fact, in PDF format. So you can follow along with the bouncing ball as Parviz talks about uh, digital transformation. Now third, and we highly encourage this by the way, we, uh, we want you to be able to ask questions during the presentation. And you can do this by selecting the Ask Question option and entering your question. And we will have time at the end of the presentation to answer these. Uh, if we don't have a chance to answer this, if we get inundated with lots and lots of great questions, there will be a Q&A blog uh, posted a couple of days, maybe a week later after the, after the broadcast of this webinar. So you can make sure that if you do ask a question, it will get answered. Now finally, and most importantly, you can rate the presentation. Now this is important to us because it gives us a solid indication of whether we're delivering the right quality of content. So please rate the presentation at the end. Giving us a, a presentation rating at the first two minutes doesn't always give us what we need to know. So if you don't mind waiting until the end, and then you can give your, your honest and candid rating. A score of one means that you'd rather have spent your time out cleaning a septic tank, while a score of five means it was absolutely perfect for you. So you can also send us comments and feedback on our webcast program. And you can let us know if we're covering the topics that you want to hear about. Hey, I did tell you that this was going to be the administrative trivia stuff. So before we get too far, a quick uh, dive into the legal notice just before we get into that detail of the presentation. It's a standard legal disclaimer. Basis of this is to remind you that the material is SNEA copyright and uh, to detail those conditions under which the material may be used. This is also in the, in the downloaded attachments. So it's also going to tell you that SNEA is not providing any legal advice here, and so we're not providing any warranties expressed or implied within the context of this presentation. So in other words, you're going to be using this material at your own risk. Ooh, sounds very ominous. So before we get uh, any, uh, too much further, any further, before we get started, a quick note about SNEA itself. So SNEA is a worldwide organization that is involved in the creation, administration, and education of all things storage. Sounds almost like an advertisement for the webinar, doesn't it? So we do this using our vendor neutral status uh, to develop industry-wide standards. And for that, we enlist the help of subject matter experts like RVs uh, in our membership community. And then we provide uh, some marketing and promotional programs to aid the adoption. Now, what the Cloud Storage Technologies Initiative does, uh, this is the group that is sponsoring this webinar, and thank you very much to CSTI. And it's our job to focus specifically on the ecosystem of cloud technologies. And we're responsible for educating both vendors and users on the cloud storage, the data services, and the related technologies. And all the while, we're supporting and promoting uh, the cloud business models and the architectures, just like we're doing today. Now, we don't do this alone. 
of course. So it's important that we work with the industry, both in terms of the companies and other industry associations, to incorporate a broad set of needs and requirements. And we put that into standards and other programs. Now, that's a, quite a mouthful, and I know you've been very patient. So having said all that, it's time for me to take a breath and let Parviz get to the good stuff. So Parviz, great to have you here today. Thank you very much. So tell us what we're going to be hearing about. Sure. Thanks, Jay. Uh, so today we're going to talk about, um, and well, as the title of presentation shows, AI ops and, and journey, why we are uh, basically looking into this. Instead of talking about AI ops right off the, off the bat, what I would like to talk about is why we are arriving to this point of taking advantage of newer technology, embedded analytics, and AI into IT operation, IT infrastructure management, uh, and et cetera. Uh, that gave us an idea of why we are um, um, arriving to this point. Uh, typically, most of conversation and, and presentation that I have seen, it dive into that AI ops right away. But I'm going to uh, walk you through a journey why we do need to think about this as an embedded AI in multi-layer of your architecture as those technologies become available. So first, we talk about digital transformation very brief. Uh, monolithic to microservices and cloud native, that's a trend that is uh, uh, basically uh, getting um, uh, significant traction in the market. Uh, some industries already uh, on their way and, and they have implemented for years and, and others getting into this uh, trend. Uh, we are moving from a request-driven architecture to event-driven architecture, and I talk about why architectural fitness, uh, where we talk about architecture, how do we make sure that architectures are healthy? Uh, and, and I will, again, many of these topics I will touch and go to just build the bridge between these different topics until I get to the AI ops at the end. Uh, and journey to hybrid multi-cloud, uh, I believe that we are really getting to that stage of a majority of um, uh, companies worldwide uh, that I work with looking into uh, hybrid multi-cloud. Uh, as a strategic direction, of course, the implementation takes some time between uh, zero to five years, depends on maturity of the infrastructure. Uh, I will talk about the role of the data architecture because we are, I personally, I believe, but there are significant indication based on the same flow I just talked to you about, that data is the center of our uh, uh, architectures today. So we are in a data-driven architecture era that we need to really think about that more seriously. We thought about data as a byproduct most of the time and up to now. We really need to think about data as an asset uh, and how do we manage that as a product as well. I'll talk about that and managing the complexity. As we go through monolithic microservices, cloud native, uh, and uh, building this new generation of infrastructures, application development, cultural uh, aspect as well, uh, we need different type of tooling. We need different philosophy of looking at managing, governing, uh, securing, uh, and, and different aspect of this infrastructure as we go forward. Uh, uh, I will start with digital transformation, as I mentioned, because I believe that's where we are all heading, especially with COVID-19. Uh, one of the impact of it is that accelerating this, not only from a corporate culture and corporate uh, technology strategy, but as, as a society itself, um, uh, moving from what we were six months ago, the way we lived, the way we thought, and, and technologies we use, and, and, the term, and, and the way we conduct everyday business has changed significantly. And all of that become part of the new norm that we at the center of technology development, we need to think about that seriously. So in terms of digital transformation, what we are seeing as, 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 as an indication of moving to this era of full digital uh, is that in the past, we, we've been talking about digital transformation in the last at least eight or nine years. Uh, but uh, the majority of efforts to go toward digital transformation haven't been as successful as they thought uh, at the beginning. Uh, uh, and um, 
the reason for that was we we just try to do to get to that digital transformation by ignoring many aspects of the full digital transformation, including organizational, cultural, and, uh, the business processes, and technology. We started with technology. We brought an API-based approach to this, put an API in front of rest of legacy infrastructure, and made that available. Uh, into end users, so have a better experience and capability. We didn't really re-architect and, and rebuild some of the tech and capabilities that enable full digitalization. What are those capabilities? And, and we are seeing it very clearly today, real time. We need access real time. People lose patient after 500, uh, after, after a second or two, uh, if they don't get where they want to go. Uh, they wanted to have that capability all time. It should be seamless. It should be personalized. Uh, it, it's predictive. They, they have a lot of intelligence built into it that help um, people to do different, make different decisions. And it should be for everyone everywhere. That's the reality of a digital society, not just digital transformation for enterprise. And enterprises are part of society. Uh, the same people live outside of enterprise, live inside of uh, enterprise as well. And, and this is where the cultural change is going to impact this transformation um, uh, much heavily, especially as I mentioned after uh, COVID-19. So we need to deliver those capabilities, but how do we do that? And that's a challenge that we've been facing uh, since the uh, um, conversation uh, on moving into a digital a world and digital transformation. Uh, I, throughout this presentation, I use multiple research companies that they have done a great job on explaining part of this uh, strategy development. I, I picked part of IDC Future Escape in here. They have a lot more prediction. Uh, but three of them that I thought is, is makes sense for this conversation. Number one, that um, by 2021, which is just next year, 90% of the worldwide rely on mix on-premise and in the cloud. Uh, On-prem could be cloud as well, by the way. So it's just a private cloud. It could be a public cloud or mixture of both. Uh, but this is what we're going to see is a mixture of both. And that gets us to next, how this mixture of both is going to be operated. So by 2020, 70% of the enterprises will deploy uh, the unified VMs, Kubernetes, container technology, multi-cloud management processes. So this gave us a glimpse of to deliver a digital capabilities in a speed and, and capability and, and uh, ease of use and, and uh, personalization, etc. that I talked about. We do need to think about we will have a multi-cloud architecture going forward. In next three to five years, majority of enterprises will get there. The capabilities they need to really look into if understanding the, the hybrid world. How do I manage and govern it? Uh, what are the areas that I have to focus in terms of security, cybersecurity, different aspects of the security, especially data protections? And how do I deliver it with agility? That's where the conversation on Kubernetes and new generation of container technologies coming in. And along with that, there is a lot of other concept that comes in, which I discussed during the presentation. And last but not least, by, by 2022, 60% of the organization have invested in automation. Uh, and, and uh, orchestration, development, lifecycle management of cloud native applications. Uh, and, and that's a reason, one of the reasons I, I talked about AI ops, because as you build this infrastructure, a, a hybrid environment with multiple virtualization technologies, uh, and you do need to automate the process to manage this complex environment. It will be complex, will be more complex, but our answer to complexity always been uh, managing the complexity with effective tools and continue to move forward. The world is not going to be simpler and simpler. It will get complex. But how do you manage that complexity determine uh, uh, the outcome of the effort that organization put together? We are seeing new species of enterprises is emerging, as you are seeing. Uh, uh, Capital One, uh, 80, um, they will really, by 2025, they would like to have 80% of their codes 
and, uh, and enterprise digital services will be externally sourced. So they want to combine hybrid in-source, outsource combination, and they break it down in, in a way that they can partners with others to deliver the capabilities. I was in another podcast just earlier today that they all talked about how they want to be partnering not only with them, FinTech and, and InsureTech and different type of tech companies as well as big tech companies so they are able to, to move forward. Uh, so that's one capability. It's TA and uh, TIAA, which is an insurance company for, for teachers, uh, they are looking for, uh, to 60% of the enterprise will deploy a code into production daily by 2025. Well, in order to do that, again, you need to build that capabilities and associated governance model, et cetera. Uh, and over 520 million new apps and services will be deployed by 2024. All of this indication is that enterprises need to spend more money and thinking strategically on how to develop this environment. As you are seeing on the left-hand side, 51% uh, of the IT budget will be focused on digital innovations and transformation combination. So we are seeing new species of um, enterprise emerging, not only uh, as an organization, but also new capabilities in application development. We are seeing low-code and no-code application gaining momentum. That makes it, um, uh, now that create new type of developers, application developers. Um, the type that they are domain expert developers, vertical specific. Uh, advanced developers that they, they develop new generation of application. And also citizen developers. Citizen developers are the one who can take advantage of low code or no code. And, and that kind of democratizing the development environment. However, to have all of that capability within an enterprise, you have to be able to manage it effectively. So, and we are seeing that AI and um, machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, business intelligence, and, and different type of analytics are gaining traction within enterprises. We will see more and more of advanced analytics capability embedded into enterprise infrastructures, application, communication, collaboration, etc. Uh, and uh, in order to take a look at it, what's the effect of that? Uh, this picture that has been developed by Gartner really greatly uh, depicts this uh, change going from legacy into digital businesses. Uh, in the legacy environment, which is with conventional businesses, as you can see, uh, the head office, back office, and infrastructure operations, they all have their autonomy in terms of control. And they, they focus on the outcome. These two are really clear. Uh, relationship between those. However, you are seeing on the uh, digital business, there are two other capabilities. Agility and autonomous capabilities are taking significant role, especially if you look at in the infrastructure and operation, it changed to in, in platform approach and ecosystem development. Uh, as I mentioned in Capital One example, ability to partner with others and, and deliver capabilities, uh, that become part of also the future business, uh, uh, digital business. Uh, front office, you're seeing that outcome plus the agility uh, and innovation. Uh, that, that's part of that. Uh, basically, they are, we need to develop those capabilities. And in terms of um, head office, they want it to be not only agile, but also autonomous as well. So these are distribution of uh, type of capability that needs to be developed um, in order to uh, provide a successful transformation into full digital capabilities and business. Now, we know that this is a reality of our, our world in, in IT environment, that we do have monolithic application architecture today. Now, many have mainframe or similar type of architecture. Majority of our application development architecture in the last 40, 50 years, um, it's really been uh, in, in tightly coupled environment. Uh, and the way that we could scale in that um, type of architecture, it's been by scaling up. So <clears throat> building a bigger systems. 
Now, we, in, in early 2000, we saw a change in terms of uh, introducing new concept of service-oriented architecture, decoupling, loosely coupling, uh, and, um, and that kind of evolved into uh, late um, uh, 2015. Uh, and, uh, and we start seeing hybrid monolithic microservices. What that means is, Part of the service is still on, on the monolithic architecture. Let me take a uh, use the example of mainframe. You can have uh, many of aspects of mainframe are still in place, but taking some component of the mainframe uh, and uh, use that and turn it into a microservices. So it become kind of hybrid environment of monolith microservices. And then we saw that increasingly and, and uh, increase in adoption of microservices basic architecture, which focused on service module, modules are distributed, they are loosely coupled or fully decoupled. And, and for a scalability, we use a scale-out deployment strategy. What we are seeing nowadays in last three or four years and, and up to now, and that uh, serverless architecture, which is, relies on concept of microservices, gaining more momentum. Uh, the concept of a stateful, which your application reserve uh, the session information, or a stateless, which it doesn't uh, apply that, that the same environment uh, uh, or IT infrastructure because of the need of uh, scalability or other capabilities in, in a different way. We have hearing about immutable. Uh, that means uh, you are building an infrastructure that uh, you cannot change. It's designed that way. Uh, or mutable, which you can change that. Uh, and they both coexist with each other. These are not just uh, marketing terminology or invented names or terms. It is the reality of current environment. Depends on type of um, uh, uh, basically uh, business you are or vertical industries you are. Some in some area you are seeing serverless architectures is almost 60, 70 percent of the entire IT infrastructure. In others, uh, the, the mixture is different. But but knowing all of this, uh, this is a reason I'm building up the re uh, capabilities we need to to have in an IT environment to help us to deal with this type of migration. The way we do the migration or transformation uh, is either we do replatform, so we move from one platform to another. Let's say just example of that going from mainframe to x86. Uh, then we re-architect. We re-architect the entire stack. In the first one, we don't re re you don't have to re-architect, you re-platform. But here, you're re-architecting the entire um, application and workload on a new platform, and that, that's a, another approach. And the last one is refactoring. Uh, and uh, this is where we are seeing, again, a microservices, DevOps concept, new generation of IT operation and software development life cycles are coming together to be able to allow the IT environment to deal with complexities. Uh, but all three aspects of it is being used today. Uh, as uh, for uh, new application development, majority of customers are using uh, basically Greenfield. Now, there is another concept that we need to really uh, take into consideration when we're talking about any of these approaches, whether we talk about microservices, cloud native, and also in terms of um, uh, type of architecture, stateful or stateless, immutable or mutable, is that how do we deal with different aspects of this architecture? And in this case, I'm talking about the scalability. So we are seeing uh, from a design consideration for this type of environment, uh, you can scale by horizontal duplication, cloning. So think about um, container or virtual machines that you can clone the same application multiple times and, and be able to scale it significantly and very quickly. Uh, and I think container technology are taking this by, by a storm, and it's going to um, enable us even further beyond what we had with now we call legacy virtualization. Uh, on the x-axis, uh, uh, in the y-axis, uh, scaling by functions decomposition. So that's an application environment. You and the split in different functionalities, and different capability of an application into different functions. Perhaps you have third function as a services or FOSS. 
Um, that, that's the result of a similar concept, that we break down a, a larger capabilities into a smaller component. Now we can scale those uh, capabilities in totally different dimension. And lastly, on z-axis, is a scaling by data partition. And, and you are seeing the relationship between uh, the infrastructure's scalability into application scalability and into now data scalability. Because all of those capabilities we talked about, especially in application, rely on the data. And how do, how do we deal with the data is becoming part of the major conversation of today's discussion. Uh, but before I get to that, this is also um, uh, important to pay attention to communication. Communication in a monolithic architecture is different. Typically, majority of our development, as I mentioned, focused on request-driven. It's a push-pull architecture. Uh, we push the command. We have the application do certain um, uh, uh, basically uh, act. And then we, uh, we, we pull, we query. Uh, and that's really that's an architecture that we've been using for some time. We are still going to use it to a certain extent going forward. But we are seeing more and more of event driven based architecture. Remember in the beginning, I mentioned digital transformation rely on real time all the time. So that type of behavior from a user drive the application development and underlying infrastructure uh, that um, basically you can run the application on top. And then in an event driven architecture, this communication is different. You publish, and other components will subscribe. And this pops up approach will bring up significant uh, flexibility. Uh, ease of use and scalability on the dimension that I just mentioned. Your data can be um, uh, scaled. Your infrastructures can scale, as well as your application development environment. So pops up application development is what really we are um, developing majority of new generation of application. Um, uh, uh, so that is add to one of the components of the um, digital infrastructure. This is an example of um, decomposition of, of monolithic to microservices, banking application example. Uh, so you are seeing that uh, you do have a monolithic application run, let's say, on a mainframe, uh, that um, a loan and deposit and, and uh, credit cards, different components of that. Uh, this, this is a hybrid model I just referred to in, in a couple of slides before, that you take one as one, you can start by taking one service, which is loan, and turn that into a microservice. And then you can do a start doing that with others and others. The reason is important to approach that in this way, and I've seen it many banks worldwide doing this approach, is that <clears throat> enable them to learn. And the difficulty of figuring out what should be there based on your uh, longer term strategy. And, and in this architecture, it is absolutely clear uh, to have a good understanding, not only on application logic, but more importantly, on where the data is going to reside. Majority of project that has been unsuccessful because they really didn't think about data strategy. And, and um, they ran into significant challenges. Whether data connectivity was one problem, but the more important legacy uh, latency of application. Uh, so this is very important that you combine those concepts together as you yes, moving into uh, this uh, the new generation of microservices environment. This is another example just depicting the same concept in a broader uh, sense that you have monolithic application. They are functioned within the monolithic application. Break it down to the different, uh, what we did, we put an API in front of it. At first, we provide a service layers and services delivered to rest of the environment, application environment. Now we took the same function out of that uh, monolithic application and, uh, and turn it into a microservices environment. Now, in this architecture, what is happening, there are multiple ways you can design that. But majority of microservices application environment rely on their own databases. And you can have multiple databases. You can have uh, SQL, NoSQL, uh, and, and, uh, and, and that, that gives you flexibility. 
uh, to design your application or run the application on the best platform uh, and database and a storage capability that allow you to provide SLAs that you guarantee. Now, we did this in just on-prem. Now, the, 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 the trend that we are seeing, this is moving into uh, direction that uh, <clears throat> it's going to be multi-cloud. Why? One of the reasons for multi-cloud is, of course, is cost. Right. So managing the costs. If there are multiple cloud service providers that allow you to run similar application in their environment, you can spawn it up when you need it, uh, or permanently have it there, uh, allow you to have these capabilities that run those services uh, that could be run in autonomous uh, uh, fashion in different cloud vendors. It depends on capabilities and pricing and so forth. Uh, yeah, but still you have to understand and think carefully about data. Where the data is going to reside, what type of medium you're using to transfer and store the data, it's play important role. And the capabilities that you need to be able to manage with a single pan of glass across the uh, uh, your cloud and on-prem environment and multi-cloud. So um, th this is where really I, I was going to try to emphasize on that the role of data architecture. And data architecture will uh, determine uh, how you deliver different services and type of storage and networking capabilities you need to have in place uh, to successfully drive in this. Now I talk about architecture fitness function. This is a touch and go topic because that's this really need whole hour talking about that. But what we are seeing that with the complex infrastructure, you do need to come up with a new way of testing, the debugging, tracking, logging, etc. It is the, the traditional way of doing it in a monolithic application was much simpler uh, and, and very uh, deterministic. In a microservices environment, that uh, environment changing from application development for from life cycle application development to production environment uh, and underlying infrastructures, which is goes from one cloud to another, etc. This requires a lot more thinking and new tooling, uh, tooling in addition to the architectural concept that you put in, put in place, you need to put in place, or they're managing this. So you need to look at, at atomic and holistic capabilities and associated with that, and testing the fitness of your architecture, continuous project, manual or automatic combination um, that require for many aspects of development of this complex environment, and looking at trend and threshold. This is where some of the new intelligent capabilities play a significant role. Example of this type of tooling for a complex environment is what Netflix developed with chaos engineering concept. So intentionally breaking down the system uh, to, to be able to determine the behavior of system uh, in a runtime uh, environment. And those capability and philosophy of doing this type of operation is really important to be understood not only by one group, by the entire IT environment, from application developer uh, to operational, uh, to infrastructures, storage, networking, compute, etc. because this all play together. So moving from traditional um, architecture. Is there any questions so far, Jay? Um, a, a few, but we can hold off until the end. That's quite all right. Excellent. If there is a need for any clarification, please let me know. Absolutely. Sure. Thank you. So we, we, uh, we talked about this complexity and, and how to deal with that new concept that is available in the market, and many folks are working on this and already deployed some. Uh, cloud native and hybrid multi-cloud is here to stay. Uh, and majority of executives that I am interacting with, engineers and IT architects, they understand the necessity of understanding, educating, as well as deploying, implementing, deploying, and, and continuous in a continuous operation. So container technology, microservice, service mesh, DevOps, APIs, these are all uh, a, um, uh, different topics, but they are fully related to each other. And uh, understanding that and building an environment to, to support and maintain it 
uh, it's very important. Part of the conversation that I didn't touch on, uh, I just want to say at this point is, with this all new environment, you really need to understand on either acquire new skill set, develop this new skill set, retrain people, uh, and build up these capabilities. Because this is something that we all face in today. Uh, talent management, talent, uh, talent acquisition, and, and uh, talent um, uh, basically maintaining the talent within your organization. And this is something you should, with this concept, play important role. Another area that I mentioned overall up to now was we do need different type of monitoring. That the term observability is something that you can hear it in, in many places that we talk about cloud native or new generation of microservices. And that really linked into the concept of we, we need a collaborative monitoring, alerting, logging, tracing combination together to be able to make a sense of environment and deal with it with, within a context of, of the events. <coughs> I put together this simple, I'm sorry if you can't see it clearly, but if you download the presentation, you can see that. I, I, I talked about this concept about, uh, about four or five, six months ago, and talking about that there are three layers in developing this new generation of architecture, uh, network fabric, system fabric, and data fabric, which is allow you to connect between different cloud service providers and your on-prem. We start with on-prem, we develop one with one cloud service providers with the second and third. Uh, the, the, the final stages of this development are really a portable um, uh, portability capability. That means I can run my workload at any given time on-prem or in any other cloud vendors that I choose to work with. And to develop that, you do need to have certain capability on the network storage layer, compute layer as well as applications and data. As I mentioned, data will determine a lot of this because where the locality matters uh, and also uh, where the regulation and, and uh, enforce uh, also impact significantly the way you will deal with the data. And that's where determined do you need to have layer two capabilities for connectivity to your service provider using SD-WAN, uh, using software-defined network, different technologies. But these three fabric play important role in your um, uh, existing and future development, and especially future development in a hybrid world. We talked about data and, and what we have seen so far in, in, in the market since 2000, uh, which we solely rely on data mods and data warehouse, shifting to developing a single repositories uh, called uh, data repositories. Uh, and uh, take advantage of that, uh, the places that we need to break it down to add uh, new capabilities or locality uh, into it, we have done it. Then we moved into multiple repositories. And this the multiple repositories uh, were within a different business unit. That th this is a start of uh, siloed issues that we are dealing with today. So we had multiple repositories whenever the BUs and, and, and different group um, wish to have their own specific repositories, they created one. And uh, by 2012, we saw the new concept of data lake. This was a start in 2007-06 by, by inventing Hadoop and, and Hadoop uh, Big Data Technology, but it picked up really in 2012 and after. And uh, we see to today that, that many enterprises are either built data lakes or building data lake. Uh, and the challenge is we, we approach data lake with the same mentality of monolithic applications and the same organizational structure of traditional IT. And each, now many of my customers have um, you know, tens of data lakes, some 250, 60 data lakes. And that wasn't the initial concept of data lake. The idea was we bring majority of data in a single repository, we can, we can access that. But the concept was right, but implementation wasn't right. And now we are at the point that data lakes by itself heading another 
um, uh, basic the issues. And that is that we can't have all of data in one data lake. We are talking about petabytes of data. So there is a necessity for approaching uh, this problem with different uh, uh, architectural design, different technologies, uh, and uh, many of our customers are looking into um, what we call polyglot of the storage architecture. So an end underlying technology, whether using uh, the object storage and disaggregated storage uh, and um, hybrid infrastructures, um, uh, hyper, uh, hyper convergent infrastructures to deal with the challenges we are still not really looking at data itself in a correct way, even in a data lake. Many people talk about data swamps, and that's true because we, we thought we dumped everything in a data lake. We go grab it later, whereas the size of data lake increase and, and diversity of type of data we put in there make it much more difficult to actually do it with ease. Uh, so the challenge is data lakes are helpful, if you build it with purpose and the specific implementations. Uh, so it's not a data lake problem, it's an architectural approach and concept behind running the data lake that turn it into a swamp. So if you um, design a um, uh, top-down approach uh, with business uh, domains and then uh, building up a data pipeline that supports that business domain governs by an overall data lake. That's one approach, and this is something that I want to talk about uh, a little bit more, and, and that's what really we're talking about new data architecture. Uh, Martin Fowler, uh, Jean-Marc Zamani, a uh, few folks that in, in the market, and I'll call Ericsson um, uh, consultant, they've been talking about and working in this areas. One concept is data mesh data match approach. Uh, first of all, you start thinking about data as a product. So it's not a byproduct anymore. It's an asset. So you look at that from a product. Then you look at that from offering that product via the platform. So what that gave you, that agility that you have a platform that supports multiple data products, and those data products support multiple domains. And that's hence the last stage, domain-driven design. And with this approach, you are structuring your environment much more uh, uh, basically effective, especially in a microservices and cloud native environment that the, uh, the behavior of application and type of data change require changes, as well as um, emergence and increase the use of artificial intelligence both for business and IT. Uh, one of the failures of I've seen common failures in uh, AI projects uh, is that uh, doing a 1, 2, 3, 10, 20 AI projects is fine, it's costly because you have to develop it in siloed with the Tiger team. But when you're thinking about hundreds and thousands of that AI projects, you can be logically and physically support those because the data pipeline development is really challenging. The scaling that talent management that I mentioned is another part. So approaching the data with the product, with the platform, and domain driven is one of the ways that we see uh, going forward is going to help solving some of the issues that we are talking about. If you take a look at new environment uh, for this data mesh architecture, including everything else in an enterprise, this is kind of a very high level. Um, a diagram depicting this environment that you have uh, multiple heterogeneous computing. And so as you know, CPU, GPU, FPGA, and ASIC becoming common for multiple use cases. Uh, then you have different type of network environment, whether you're physical or uh, uh, manage virtually software-defined network and uh, SD-WAN, et cetera, uh, functions versus service. Um, you, you, all of us have many of these combinations. The storage architecture centralized, distributed, disaggregated. And so we are going to live with this environment. Uh, we still have to support new capabilities. Kubernetes and service mesh and, and container technology are enable us to create a composable infrastructure as well as, well as disposable infrastructure because um, in many cases, you don't really need to go fix a problem in, in an image that you had in, in a container. You just disregard the container. You bring in new container online right away. 
that way you don't spend time to fixing things. You are bringing new capabilities as is, tested, verified, and put it into production. And that's the concept we talk about, the stateless, the stateful, immutable, immutable, composable, and disposable. And, and on top of that, the, your application, mobile application environment, which is they are stateless, they are much suited for immutable infrastructure. Enterprise messaging is part of mutable infrastructures and immutable in some cases. Uh, and utilization of ActiveMQ, different type of basically messaging bus. And, and Kafka is becoming the king in this environment because of the capabilities, fast, low latency, uh, and um, enabling the pop-sub architecture that I talked about. Enterprise data services that I mentioned, uh, both a stateful, mutable, and a stateless implementation of that. Uh, Redis, MySQL in memory uh, application, which is gaining significant tra traction, uh, SQL and NoSQL, uh, and graph databases, etc. Those are all part of our arsenal, and, and they are solving some challenges. However, again, the underlying architecture that support all of that needs to be well thought out, and I, I mentioned the new data architecture. There are many characteristics for um, um, a storage, especially designed for cloud native and microservices. I don't get to the detail due to the time concern. Uh, so I'll talk about application centricity, application agnostic capabilities, declarative and composable capabilities, as I just talked about. Uh, API-driven, uh, self-managed, um, at some of the autonomous capability, as I mentioned. Uh, agile, which is fast time to market. Many want to uh, uh, basically enable their applications and environment uh, to be able to support that agile capabilities. Is a high performance relevant to the application needs and SLAs. Uh, natively secured rather than add-on securities, and this is another aspect that, that um, uh, really coming into place with AI ops later I will talk about, consistency, availability, and observabilities. Those are the major components of the new uh, storage architecture for cloud native environment. So now come back to the discussion of how do we manage this environment. We, we really need to understand this different type of analysis before we have done log analysis. It's not something new. But what is new is about this, how are we doing it in this complex environment? How do we make a sense of different type of events uh, that happen uh, uh, in our environment? And, and how do we make that correlation and, and relation between those events to actually get to the root cause? And that is changing, and this is why I'm talking about AI ops in a microservice cloud native operation require every aspect of the environment to provide uh, easy access to logs, tracing, uh, monitor, uh, and, and monitoring capabilities. And um, for a storage architecture, we really need to build those capabilities as native. So as for application network and every other aspect, we are, we are not in that level yet. And those capabilities is becoming to market um, uh, uh, by different vendors in different levels and capabilities. We need to have a service management monitoring, application performance monitoring, cross-domain analysis with AI, IT infrastructure, cost analysis is very important uh, in, in a multi-cloud and new generation of complex environment, as well as networking and monitoring and diagnostic. So all of this capability as part of what will be going forward uh, observability. So type of telemetry that we collect nowadays beyond just CPU, which is basic monitoring, CPU memory, disk, latency network within a system, is a system-wide monitoring. So core infrastructure, application development, IT operation, business services, uh, alerting, visualization, automated response, uh, autonomous capability I mentioned to you, which is not only responding to a specific event, but also um, um, broadcasting the capabilities and, and the after uh, impact of the event that happening in the uh, complex system. Uh, distributed system tracking, uh, scaling as an infrastructure scale, uh, that's another important. Well, if you run in your on-prem and uh, you want to run also in the multiple clouds, well, how do you manage this scalability on the fly? 
uh, and how do you control all aspects that we just talked about. Topology awareness, and that's another important factor, that the topologies are determining a lot of implementation out in cloud environment, so the tools have to have that capabilities. Uh, automated canary uh, analysis, as we bring in more capabilities uh, in, into our development environment. Log aggregation, distributed tracing, the static dynamic threshold, uh, fault detection, service quality, and cost factors. Those are capabilities that uh, needs to be in place to enable us to really smoothly run in this complex environment, as I mentioned, in the next three to five years. Uh, so that, that's where we are. So this is where AI ops, by the way, AI, AI ops was a coin, term that coined by Gartner um, uh, about uh, two or three years ago, uh, and is gaining more and more momentum because the necessity. It's not fancy tools that I would like to have it. It will become a necessity to have these tools. Otherwise, I can operate the environment effectively. Uh, so what AI ops really uh, means is, is taking advantage of machine learning and big data capabilities uh, to not only observe, but uh, from an observation, which is log and tracing, uh, create the context, a semantic context that it is understandable by a machine and system and human being combination. This is ultimate goal of that, which is rely on uh, provide some of the autonomous capability I mentioned, focused on uh, observing, monitoring, acting, automation, and engaging in ITSM, uh, which is all of this together uh, uh, will help us to deal with complexity of the environment. Uh, is not only doing historical analysis, which mostly we are doing, but we are combining historical analysis with anomaly detection, performance analysis, correlation, and contextualization of the data. Uh, and of course, as a result of that, provide task automation, change risk analysis, uh, you know, performance analysis, and become a knowledge base for continuous uh, uh, development and, and delivery of uh, capabilities by IT organization. If you take a look at in, under the hood of a uh, AI ops, uh, which is deliver business dashboards, feed into DevOps, and as, as part of the DevOps, basically, an operation combination, is relies on API and agent streaming and batch-oriented com combination to enable this data collection, data analysis in real time, historical, uh, and uh, based on um, uh, platform discovery, anomaly detection, and can uh, causalities, right? Uh, so, and all of this rely on really new generation of um, uh, artificial intelligent algorithm, especially with the uh, neural network and deep learning uh, capabilities. This is where these tools can offer. At last, uh, that's my last slide, I brought all of this together, a domain-based data services architecture where that feed into different domains. Uh, it is in a hybrid multi-cloud uh, and use AI ops, both internal and external and in between in a hybrid to deliver all the capabilities. With that, John, I'm open for Q&A. Excellent. We do have a couple of questions that we can ask uh, in the time that we've got left. Uh, some of it actually comes into the data lake stuff. There's a, there's a few questions that are, are probably worth addressing, so we might as well just try to get those out and see if we have any time left over. Uh, so l let's revisit the whole concept of the data lake just, uh, just for the help of level setting things. So let's, if you don't mind, define the, the data lake itself as in particular how it's different from other data storage models, and that may be a good starting point. <coughs> So, so the concept of data lake was, as I mentioned, it started with uh, distributed Hadoop architecture. The, the, the idea was that we're going to bring in compute and data together and provide a scalability on both compute and the data at the same time. Uh, majority of problem we had in the past was that, okay, I do have Oracle database or SQL database or any other databases uh, in one environment, and it is all structural, by the way. But at the time that we look at data lake, the idea was that I want to have a structure, summary structure, on a structure, combining what the one environment, an ability that on top of that do analytics. 
That was the reason that we looked at data lakes. It wasn't data storage. It was data lakes with the capability of having direct analytics on top of that. And Hadoop really provide that. So Hadoop had uh, HDFS and has HDFS, which is allow you to store data without change. You don't have to modify it. Previously, we used ETL processing. One of the major hurdles that we, we faced before was the ETL processing took a long time. And when you create a schema, you could not change that easily. It takes a long time to do. So flexibility wasn't there. Ability to do an ETL for all of the data, a structure on a structure and everything else, and put it back into a, a structured database wasn't there either. So we were facing a dilemma that we are getting so many data, especially on a structure in 2010 and after, that require thinking of new architecture. And that was a data lake came out of that necessity that we need to deal with the, all these three types and be able to do analytic on top of it, whether it's batch, whether it's a streaming, or the concept of real time or near, near real time depends on application layers. And that's where data lakes really brought to us, a place that I can put any type of data, regardless of format, and be able to retrieve that information when I need it. And I do ETL processing on the fly. Before we did ETL on, well, a schema on right, now we are doing a schema on read. So when I need it, I pull it and do ETL, so that is much easier to manage and also deal with the, the significant volume of the uh, data that we were facing. I hope that I, I explained the data lake concept and why it was actually created uh, at a time uh, by multiple folks uh, in the industry. Uh, that was the reason behind it. And that data lake eventually evolved into the concept of that we need to not only provide a data analytics combination, but data services. And that become more prominent. And that's new, some of the new uh, the kind of hybrid environment that uh, vendors offer, uh, that that was a capability to combine a data warehouse with data, data lake, which is big data, Hadoop, and be able to provide a best of the um, both world to the customers that who rely on the structured data, especially for transaction capability and on a structured data for other uh, analysis. Okay. So, well, we do have some additional questions that we're probably going to have to wait until the Q&A blog, I'm afraid, because we're, we're pushing up to the top of the hour. Uh, would you like to do a quick summary before we, we wrap things up? Sure, absolutely. And, and I apologize, I have to go through all of that, and we didn't have a time for Q and Q and A, but uh, I will answer this question. Digital transformation is necessity. It's not a fancy term. It's not a marketing term. You are seeing the fact of COVID-19 is highlighting some of that already for executive level, but we are seeing it in rest of organizations within an enterprise. Legacy application and infrastructure, they are barrier to digitization. Very obvious, it does require uh, effort as well as um, investment to migrate from that. Journey to cloud native and microservices require rethinking of your enterprise architecture. When I say enterprise architecture, include the entire environment from business processes, policies, and uh, uh, governments, as well as technology combination. Uh, we are at the age of data-centric architecture. Don't forget that. Data is not a byproduct. You've got to think about it as a product. And in, in the design of your hybrid multi-cloud, the design of your artificial intelligence, all rely on data. Therefore, the storage architecture and networking and computation, how do you all of this together? Managing microservices environment is complex. Uh, and require new approach. That's for AI ops. It's a key technology. We are at the earliest stages of AI ops, but the new vendors keep adding features and capabilities, new method of, um, method of analyzing data. Analytic and AI will be integrated in all aspects of enterprise life. Get ready for that, and that's why I keep saying don't forget about data architecture, because that's how you can do this and using this newer technology with much ease and higher quality. Thanks, John. In short, break yourself. <laughs> Brace yourself. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so uh, 
Uh, really quick, in, in the last minute that we've got, I would like to remind you to please wait, rate the webcast and uh, provide us with some feedback. We use it and we read every comment, we read every, every uh, question, we read every criticism, and we do take it to heart. So please do get, uh, rate the broadcast. Uh, it would be very, very much appreciated. Uh, we are going to be posting a Q&A. We only had a chance for one question this webinar, but we do have more to offer. So we will be uh, posting a Q&A on the SNEA Cloud blog at sneacloud.com. And we do have this webinar and uh, a, a copy of the slides of what, as well as some other uh, informational webinars that you may be interested in at the Educational Library on SNEA. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at, at SNEA Cloud. So thank you very much. Thank you, Parviz. Appreciate all of your attendance today. I know you have other things that you probably um, need to do, so we really do appreciate your attendance. Thank you so much, and have a great thank day. Thank you. Bye.